Good evening. I am Tim O'Reilly with Aortic Hope, I'm the Director of Community Relations and the moderator of our monthly nighttime support group. It is Aortic Disease Awareness Month, and we are joined by a special guest tonight to answer your questions. Um, he is from the Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, my personal surgeon and friend. Um, and he is here to answer your questions until I deem he's had enough or if he needs to go off and, you know, perform surgery or something. Dr. Ben Udelman, welcome. Hello, hello, Tim. It's good to see you live and in person. I know, it's been a while. This morning, in fact. <laughs> Sorry I'm in my uh, fancy fatigues. I uh, just did come out of the operating room, but I'm glad I'm here. It makes you look more official. <laughs> So what can you tell us about the aorta? You know, Jim, um, as you know, I really, um, uh, this is one of those subjects that uh, is very near and dear to my heart, you know, uh, and now that I've been doing this for so many years, there's very uh, good friends of mine who have been suffering from these problems. And it, it is definitely a underdiagnosed, underappreciated and to a large extent, unknown cause for tremendous anxiety and tremendous concern um, uh, that people who have it in their family now have to worry about it and things of that nature. So uh, I think one of the major topics that I like to address in this forum is the simple fact that even though it is something that a lot of people don't talk about and don't want to talk about. It is a source of tremendous, tremendous anxiety and tremendous, tremendous worry. And my number one goal with all the work that I do, as you well know, outside of the operating room and outside of the hospital is just try to instill a little bit of pure unadulterated facts to help people navigate the stress and anxiety associated because as my wife has told me many times, um, expectation management is by far uh, the best way to reduce anxiety. And when people are faced with something as unknown as something that they may have never heard of in their life, may have never heard of in their family, may have never heard of even on television, and all of a sudden they have to deal with it as a disease process, um, I know it's a source of tremendous stress. What is the aorta, first off? So the aorta is the largest blood vessel. It starts at the exit door of the heart, which is called the aortic valve. And the aortic valve is a very simple valve. It opens and closes with the contraction of the left ventricle. And the aorta at the base of it, right after it comes out of the heart, functions similarly to the heart in that it's a very muscular tube. And when it expands, filling with blood because the heart ejects, it will then contract back, the aortic valve will close and it will push blood both into the rest of the aorta and into the rest of the blood vessels of the body. But the best way to understand its function is that it's the trunk of the tree and it is the actual tree that gives rise to all the branches the bad part with that analogy is obviously the trunk is filled with stuff. This is like a hollow trunk with a tube, but same same concept. And what are some of the um, issues that can present with the aorta? The overwhelming majority of the time, the aorta presents as an incidental finding from someone often who has a family history, but may or may not even know this, they'll get into a car accident or they will have a cough or a cold or they'll have a little pain or discomfort in their chest and they'll wind up in a CAT scan or in the emergency department. And the next thing that happens is somebody uses these crazy word aorta and then you meet somebody like me 
And that's when the anxiety really starts, right? Exactly. Um, so in your job as a surgeon, what, uh, what particular cases do you focus on? So the, the majority of my cases are elective aortic surgery. Uh, since I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon uh, and I'm on the chest side of the aortic business, um, I will do surgeries from the aortic valve, including the aortic valve, all the way up and over what's called the aortic arch down to the area of the diaphragm. And my co-director in the aortic center, Dr. Ree, will, he and his colleagues will do operations in the belly. So the majority of the operations that I do involve the aortic root and the ascending aorta, and that's the area from the exit door right up to the branches that go to your right arm and to your brain. And what, <clears throat> are, what is an aneurysm? Can you tell us about those? So an aneurysm is an area uh, of any blood vessel that is enlarged beyond the diameter that it's expected to be based on your height. All blood vessel size is based on height, um, because as you can imagine, somebody like myself can be a slim 225 pounds, which is what I am now, or 500 pounds, but that wouldn't really change my internal, the size of the structures inside my body, whether I chose to do one or the other. Um, and so it's based on height. And an aneurysm is an enlargement of the aorta. And we say anything larger than four centimeters is two standard deviations. It's just a mathematical term, but two standard deviations outside of the average size for the average size person. Now, if you're four foot six or you're seven foot six, you are not average and any by any stretch. And so you're dimensions are different, and we do make adjustments for that. But the aneurysm is just something that's larger than it should be. And what are some of the ways that an aneurysm can form? So in 2022, which I'm pretty sure we're still in, um, what we're dealing with is the reality that we know almost nothing about what causes these, except that as of today, there are somewhere between 30 and 35 documented genes that are associated with enlargements of the aorta. And we have other um, associated conditions that people always ask about being smoking, high blood pressure, other problems. But in reality, very few people have aortic aneurysms when they don't have a family history of some predisposition. Now, there are plenty of people for whom that is not the case. The obvious one is somebody who is adopted and doesn't know their biological family won't have that information and no way to trace it. The next group of people are people whose majority of first degree relatives have died and they would have no way of knowing that. The next group, of course, is people that come to me and they say, how could I have an aneurysm and have it be of any concern? Every single person in my family has lived to the age of 90. And I say, that's fantastic for you. But many of those people may have died with an aneurysm and maybe not died from an aneurysm. But the problem is, is that I have to take the information that's given to me and protect the patients when I see them. Okay, so uh, I have an aneurysm. My uh, aorta is bigger than average. Uh, that means it should be able to pump stronger, right? I'm, uh, I'm better. What, uh, what, 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 what's so bad about an aneurysm? Well, in your particular case, I have a touch of inside information, but 
let's go to the hypothetical. The hypothetical patient who has the enlargement of their aorta, what we learn is that the aortic wall may be thick or thin, but that the enlargement of the aorta itself is a sign that it is weak. And the weakness that's associated with the enlargements of the aorta ref are reflected in a number of events. The most dramatic one, which we will talk about, is an aortic dissection, where blood will pass through the wall of the aorta, tear back inside, and the patients will present with extreme pain. What can also occur is that the tear can ex ex you know, go through the wall and it can rupture out, in which case they have now a ruptured aorta. And those people can present with extreme pain if they're lucky. In a very, very, very rare group of people, people will present with aortic dissections years or months after they have them and those are um, tears that have occurred in some occult fashion from probably some genetic predisposition with a high blood pressure event, but the patients, for whatever reason, didn't feel any different than other people feel on a normal day, or they have a very high pain threshold, or they were participating in activities that result in a high pain threshold. And those people wind up coming in later with weakened aortic walls that are now enlarged or aneurysmal. And these uh, walking dissections, as I'm going to choose to call them from now on, um, they usually occur in the lower aorta or both? They're both, and there's no rhyme or reason to explain why any of these things would occur, except in medicine in general, we have all witnessed many patients who present with long-standing events such as ruptured appendix, such as various other medical conditions that people would normally present with pain or discomfort or shortness of breath or something, and for whatever reason, that person doesn't. So it's it's been seen many, many, many times so it doesn't surprise me that these things occur, but of course, every time I see it, I find it quite amazing. So somebody comes into the hospital or they've been seeing you for a little while and uh, it's determined that they need surgery. Um, how does that process go? By either emergency or uh, elective, it's time. So what we do is we talk to the patients and find out about all their other problems. Because once we've identified the aorta in, as needing an operation, the key is what are the patient's risk factors going into the operating room? How do we mitigate those risks by protecting them as best we can from potential problems? And what potential things could come up that have not been revealed such that we could have a problem after surgery, like they can't eat, they can't go to the bathroom, they have problems with their liver, their kidneys, all kinds of other issues can come up. The key for us is mitigating risk or trying to reduce the chances of a complication by understanding the patient as a whole. So we start with the brain and just interviewing patients. And if their brain appears normal, which in most people, it, it does appear reasonably normal. They're nervous, but they answer questions appropriately. We then go down to the lungs, episodes of shortness of breath, chest pressure, chest issues. Do they have risk factors for smoking, lung, liver, kidney problems, then goes into medical problems like bleeding, the potential for a blood transfusion, which in certain people's cases is something that they absolutely refuse. And we respect that if that's what they um uh, that's how they feel. And um, any sort of potential other problems and infection being one of the most difficult and challenging ones for us, because truthfully, when all the other problems have been addressed, infections are the things that worry us at the end of the day, because they can get involved in all of the uh, operations that we do, and sometimes in very, very unexpected ways.
Okay, we've got a question for you. All right. Some people are having um, coughing fits. They're, uh, you know, it's flu season or we, something that might be uh, detrimental to somebody's aortic health. So when you think about the event of coughing in and of itself, it is a momentary increase of intrathoracic pressure. It does slightly increase the pressure on your heart for that that moment, but it is far more important that you cough out the junk that's in your lungs that's triggering you to need to cough than whatever potential negative side effects it has on your body. So cough suppression, which is one of the issues that people always ask about, is absolutely not indicated in the overwhelming majority of cases. Cough is a natural reflex to something tickling your lungs. And there's some reason why your trachea and bronchus wants you to cough. And it's usually because there's junk in there that it's trying to get out. Uh, anybody that's uh, put a napkin or something in front of their face when they weren't feeling well, they certainly know what I'm talking about. The issue of coughing and in, in getting uh, it, the flu, and obviously COVID is, is incredibly concerning to everybody at this point, even though um, we have now decided as a society that we're going to pay less attention to it. Um, I, the truth is, is that um, people are still getting it. Lots of people are still dying from it. Um, and getting these infectious diseases and avoiding these infectious diseases is critical. But if you are talking about the relationship between an aortic aneurysm or if you've had aortic surgery and any of these viral illnesses, there is really probably a fairly minimal impact. And the only reason that I am going to mention this next issue is that if you've had surgery, there are people that have some diminished lung function as a result of their operation, because sometimes if they're not young, they can have scar tissue and the lung function can take some time to come back. Because of this, your reaction and your effect from um, any of these viral illnesses may be exaggerated, but in reality, you should get the virus and recover from it just like anybody else. So somebody has had um, life-changing surgery. What do uh, they expect in the uh, recovery process? Well, Probably the biggest issue in the recovery process are not the obvious ones. They're not the pain, the scars, the you got to get up and move, the everybody yelling at you, you know, people telling you, I can't believe you almost died, other people telling you it wasn't a big deal, depending on whether they feel like this is going to make you feel better or for worse. The thing that's the hardest by far is, is the reality that any surgical procedure, but especially ones that are of this magnitude, are forcing you to address your own fears of dying, your fears of illness and injury, your fears of spontaneous random events causing you irreparable harm, and the psychological impact of a disease process of this magnitude can be quite dramatic. The reason that we have instituted at Maimonides a early initiation of psychiatric evaluation for all patients with aortic disease is because over the years of dealing with patients with these conditions, we know that there is a significant impact on people's ability to live their life, on people's ability to get back to their job, and on people's understanding for how much a condition like this can impact your life. And if you'd like, I can actually put on some data from our recent studies. Um, I can share the screen um, if you'd like. Um, but the reality of it is that there is a, a clear um, understanding that 
these things are going to get you upset. They're going to affect your life. You're going to have a difficult time, blah, blah, blah. But there's not a clear appreciation uh, about how much. And um, I can show you, I'm getting to some of the, some of the sort of simple things. Um, how can I share my screen over here? Let me see if I can find that little share button inside the window that people have always told me about. Should be on the uh, on the tray uh, next to the microphone. Thank you. No, no, no. What, what was uh, so? You want me to address this first? So, uh, I, I, I have to uh, let. Let me address this issue first, and then let me get uh, back to that in one moment. So the one thing I wanted to mention is that every patient was, that is admitted with aortic disease is evaluated by psychiatry and referred to our support group organizations, which is uh, locally here in Brooklyn is our aortic bridge group and obviously our big sister organization, Aortic Hope. But the, 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 the take home data that I, that I tell people, the basic stuff, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of minutia. But 77% of patients who have had any type of aortic surgery, any type of aortic surgery, they have a perceived impairment in their quality of life. And to a large degree, I know from talking to patients that this, this peaks right before the patients walk into my office after having gotten a recent CAT scan where I'm about to tell them whether they're okay, whether they're mostly okay, or whether they may need, or I will suggest that they get another evaluation. I'm sorry, another operation. But that 56% of these patients after surgery will have a new psychiatric complaint of some significance such that they themselves appreciate that they don't feel quite right. And we evaluated our initial group of patients in this and some of you have made, been involved in this anonymous study, and I greatly appreciate it. Interestingly enough, we've just started to get our new set of data for 2022, which is dramatically different than this in one special area. Still, 77% are perceived impairment. 56% of people have some psychiatric complaint. 50% of them have a reduced physical activity, but it's hard for me to know whether that's because us or other physicians like me have imparted upon them this overwhelming fear that if they get up too quickly, they will head, their head will explode, and so they've been taking it to the extreme. But the other issue is that 20 to 40% of patients have work-related concerns, many who seek or go on permanent disability. And the last group that is the smallest group in this analysis, which was the analysis of our first two years, shows 6% of limited or affected sexual activity. But that has dramatically increased to 30 to 40% in our initial evaluation of the new data. And I would say that that is probably what I have also seen. The two aspects of sexual activity is obviously the overwhelming concern that they will have some sort of high blood pressure event that will cause a problem. And then the second concern is that men of a certain age, when you decrease their blood pressure with blood pressure medication, will have erectile dysfunction. These issues can all be addressed by working with your cardiac surgeon, your cardiologist, and with a urologist. On the just worry side, I think that's just going to have to be addressed by psychiatry, but certainly if erectile dysfunction 
is one of the issues that is affecting you, and there are many people who it affects, please, by all means, go see a urologist and have a conversation. And if somebody says to you, you cannot participate in sexual activity because you have an aortic problem, uh, you need to get a new doctor because that is not an appropriate way to approach someone with aortic disease. All right, we had a uh, question. <clears throat> Hello, break the boxes. Oh, he just. <laughs> and we're back. Hello, sorry about that. You still, oh, all right, he's back. We're good. Sorry about that. All right. Never say you see that little X on the corner of your screen. Hey, breaking boxes, what's going on, my friend? All right, so we had a uh, 43 years old, uh, six foot three, 3.8 centimeters, MYH1 variant, uh, more common with Ashkenazi. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. Is it? I think that you should stop yelling at me. Can you guys see this? Yep. It looks complex. Yes, it is complex. It's so complex that it's almost absurdly complex. Um, and let me try and make this. Oh, no, that doesn't work. Let's go to 150. Let's see. If, I'm just trying to make it big enough that it's uh, it looks a little bit good. So I'm going to show breaking boxes the whole deal. All right. So here's your MYH11 myosin heavy chain. Um, uh, protein right here in the middle there. I know that's exactly what you were asking about. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because this is really what the truth is here. This is what we look at when we're in medical school. These are the things we get tested on. And if you believe for one second that this cartoon drawn by some sort of graphic artist has anything to do with reality, obviously you're smarter than a lot of us in medical school who took this as gospel and committed it to memory. But the truth is, is that every couple of years, somebody decides to come up with these pretty pictures. So let's talk about the 2018 working group on aortopathy or aortic conditions. And what they did was they took about 55 genes and they put them into category A, B, C, D. And the purpose of this was to see if any of these genes are having any effect on the aorta by testing thousands of patients with aortic disease and seeing what sticks. This is the old, you know, shotgun on the side of the barn or throwing stuff onto the wall and seeing what sticks. This is what people do to get themselves promoted. And this is what people do to get master's degrees and PhDs. This is not what clinical physicians like me do to help patients. But we use this information to make you feel either better or worse, depending on what category you might fall into. So after they looked at these 50 something genes, they basically came up with 30 genes in 2018. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Then they came up with this proposed mechanism, which you can look at commit to memory, but next year I'm sure there'll be another one. But if you look at this one, which is what I wanted to show you, and you go to your MYH11 right into the in this zone, 
It's a smooth muscle cell contractile unit gene that sequences for a protein that affects the contractile elements of the aorta. And if you happen to have this one isolated gene, it's very possible that you would be at an increased risk for aortic aneurysm. Now, the issue, of course, with aortic dissection is much more complex, and the ACTA2 and MYH11 uh, genes fall in the middle between these patients who are in the TGF beta pathway that are often at very high risk for early dissection, and then these genes, which are often related to the patients that are at higher risk for aneurysm, which may or may not go on to dissection, because now we don't let you do that. Although there's some very interesting studies going on, which we can touch on if you'd like. But you're right in the middle here. The answer is, is that this is but one of the many markers that we currently have. And what about the other issues? Meaning, what about your family history? What about anybody in the family have an unexplained sudden death? Anybody in the family have aortic aneurysms that were operated on or aortic dissections that were operated on? Because when you combine the fact that you have this one piece of information with that other piece of information, then we can risk stratify you and make a decision as to should we operate on you when we meet you? Or should we operate on you at a specific size? Or in reality, do we never operate on you because of other concomitant medical problems that make the surgery such high risk that it doesn't matter what you have? So it's important to take all these things together. Oh, I love this question about the blood pressure tests. And now I'm going to go to the website called Validate bp.org, I believe is their name. You're still seeing my computer screen, right? Uh, if it comes up, great. It may not come up because they may not like it. So uh, important to know, uh, yeah, that may not work. Oh, we need another W in there, I apologize. Um, in terms of blood pressures, <clears throat> um, the blood pressure devices that are out there, um, are many, 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 including, you know, you can stick your finger in stuff, and you stick your arm in some, you can do it for real, you can do it all kinds of different ways. The reality of it is that this group has gotten together and worked to validate all of the available blood pressure cuffs. And these are some super, super smart people. Um, and I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Cohen, um, who uh, I, uh, was on a radio show with, and she actually educated me beautifully about everything I was doing wrong, which I was incredibly appreciative of. So what she recommended was that what I need to do is tell patients about these blood pressure cuffs, number one, and then tell them about the right way to check their blood pressure. The right way to check your blood pressure is as follows. Get up in the morning, Sit down for five minutes or lay down for five minutes. Take your blood pressure three times in a row. That's your blood pressure in the morning. Average of those three or the most reasonable of those three because sometimes they're off. Then in the afternoon, you do the same thing. You sit down, you know, in the evening after you've taken your medication and you do the same thing. You sit down, you wait five minutes, then you check your blood pressure just like this. When we are dealing with blood pressures and ideal blood pressures, we always talk about blood pressure and heart rate. The reason that we talk about blood pressure and heart rate together is because if your heart rate is really, really high and your blood pressure is, um, is also low, then the net impact on your aorta 
is going to be lower than if your blood pressure and heart rate were high, but there's no question that it would be better if your heart rate was low and your blood pressure is low. And for any of you math whizzes out there, you know I'm talking about calculus, which I'm too nice to ever mention on a, on a situation like this. But if you did take calculus and you like the integrals, when you integrate the information of heart rate and blood pressure, you figure out the overall aortic strain. Now, what blood pressure do I want you to have? The truth is, is that if you were going to say that to me, I said, I want your blood pressure to be as low as it can be and your heart rate to be as low as it can be without it affecting your life. We were just talking about sexual dysfunction, but then there's also, how about, can you work out? Are you able to walk up and down stairs? Are you able to, you know, feel good? Do you get lightheaded or dizzy or pass out or any of those things? Because especially as you get older, these things are going to change. So the simple answer is that your heart rate and blood pressure should be as low as it can be, but you have to be able to live your life, participate in reasonable amount of exercise, participate in sexual activity, and be able to do these things while taking a reasonable regimen of medication. Follow-up question for me personally, out of <clears throat> sheer curiosity, a um, bit of an inverse. How low is too low? Let's say well, at 95 or over 55. You know, well, I, if I, I get said, that, I eat a few saltines just in case. Yeah. So the if you think about it from this standpoint, when you're born, your blood pressure is about 60 over 40, right? And the reason the blood pressure can be so low is that the resistance in your body is so low that there's no reason to have your blood pressure be any higher. And anything above that pressure will just be a negative side effect. You understand? So that the answer always should be your blood pressure should be as low as it can be without you having any negative side effects. The only negative side effects to low blood pressure that you will not be able to see or appreciate will be things like renal dysfunction or things that will ultimately show up on some laboratory values. But in reality, if you're otherwise healthy and you have this one problem and your blood pressure is low, you feel good, your sexual function is normal, you're able to you know, live your life, you don't feel lightheaded and dizzy, you don't pass out, fall down, the number is just a number. I've got a, another question that came, uh, came up in our nightly discussions uh, a couple months ago. Um, a lot of my... Um, put this gently, older um, friends who are in the community um, who jump on our chats, uh, they undergo what's called, I believe, cardiac rehab. How is it determined who undergoes that and who doesn't? Because I don't recall being assigned any of that. Tim, that's a very, very important question because people are under the misunderstanding that the word rehabilitation means what someone else does to you or for you. And what I impart upon all the patients is that <clears throat> the second you wake up and are able to breathe on your own and then feed yourself and then get out of bed and walk around and participate in any physical activity, you are participating in physical therapy. If you're able to progress through the rehabilitative and the recovery process, and you are able to rehabilitate without any sort of assistance from other people, then what you get from cardiac rehabilitation is zero. If you tell me you go home in a month and you're out riding your bike, you're walking around, you're feeling good, all is well, you are not going to benefit from cardiac rehab. But let me tell you who benefits enormously from cardiac rehab. Two groups of people. One group of people who have had heart problems, which is not the aortic group as a general, general term. There are some people that have both, but as a general term, the aortic people probably or may or should or I hope have normal hearts. But if you have heart problems in addition to aortic problems, then what you benefit from cardiac rehabilitation because on a heart monitor, 
you get your heart rate up and blood pressure up a little bit. And some of the first signs of issues with your heart can be abnormal beats. And that will be shown on the monitor in cardiac rehabilitation. Every time I do coronary artery bypass grafting surgery, which I do fairly often as well, those patients will go to cardiac rehabilitation because if they are participating in cardiac rehabilitation, then if they have one of these arrhythmias or an abnormal beat, that will show up. But again, there are plenty of people that feel totally fine, don't have any of these palpitations, and they, and they don't have any issue. If you are a, a different group of people, and this is the people that are afraid, I've used lots of different terms, but for the purposes of this group and the anonymity that I have by just talking to all of you, if you are afraid of doing any of this physical activity because you literally think you're going to explode because you actually exploded the first time and had emergent surgery and now you're afraid you're going to explode again, going to cardiac rehabilitation is a comfortable, protected environment where you can slowly increase your activity, increase your heart rate and blood pressure. And as you look on the monitor and you have people around you that are keeping an eye on you, you feel more confident that you can do this on your own. In terms of participating sexual activity, that you're gonna to have to do on your own. But you can use the activity in the cardiac rehab as a surrogate for increasing heart rate and blood pressure that you would have during sexual activity. And if that is something of concern, you can go to your physician and say, I'd like to go to cardiac rehabilitation. Now, there are plenty of older people that go to cardiac rehabilitation and then rehabilitation for a protracted period of time. That's the same as going to the gym. The only difference is, is this is prescribed by you know, uh, various insurance plans but it's really no different than going to the gym and getting a trainer. It's just a little bit more organized in terms of what's done. Uh, hi, Kelsey. Kelsey, you're pointing out something that is so important and it's so critical uh, that we probably talk about this twice at every support group meeting. Every patient always asks me about this, and I'm gonna tell you the basics. The basics are, as a national and international group, the thoracic aortic surgeons and the abdominal aortic surgeons have gotten together and have basically said, you can exercise to a moderate degree, meaning you could run a couple miles, you could bike a few miles, you can lift weights, and that your limitations are two things. One, no contact sports outside of the bedroom. Contact sports will cause you to hold your breath, will cause impact between yourself and another person, and that dramatic rise in blood pressure, which occurs in that condition, we're talking about contact in basketball, hockey, football, anything, you know, roller skating, roller derby, where you're smashing up against somebody else, that is not something we recommend you doing. And the second thing is we limit your weight lifting to 100 pounds. Now, where did we come up with 100 pounds? We used to say half of your body weight. Going back to our previous discussion about aortic size, if I was 500 pounds at six foot three, and I said, you could lift half of your body weight. Somebody said that to me, that's 250 pounds. That's not accurate. You can't do that. The ability to lift that much weight, even if you are extraordinarily strong, does reflect back on your cardiovascular system with an increase in blood pressure. And that pressure increase is not something that we want to dramatically increase. But we also want to allow people to participate in weightlifting because weightlifting, especially for women as they get older, has a dramatic beneficial effect on your bones. And there's also younger people, men and women, who lift weights. And then they show up in my office and I'm going to take away something that they enjoy and that they love. And I don't think that that's fair. So we all got together and came up with these criteria, which most everybody follows. 
there is a group of people who don't. And those are the people that don't know the disease and are scared out of their mind every time they see you come into the office, Kelsey, and they say, nothing heavier than a glass of orange juice. And by all means, make sure you sit in the back seat and people drive you everywhere at five miles an hour. And don't do anything else. These are the kind of instructions that are given by physicians who are afraid for themselves, but they're not thinking about you. Now, you're going to ask me, will this potentially cause a problem with my aortic dissection? Because you've already been told that the area of the aorta that's enlarging will be the area that's already weak. The truth is, is that what we describe is a balance between caring for your aorta and caring for the rest of your entire body. If your aorta survives 100 years and your body lives 40, there's no, I haven't done you any service. So we have to balance these two things together. And those are the central tenets of what I say when anybody ever asks me about exercise and aortic disease. All right, well, I have a question. <clears throat> Um, yes, Mr. O'Reilly, thank you. Question. Oh, I'm sorry, did I, have, I need to raise my hand. Um, in my, sur my surgery, um, I had a, an aneurysm, and it was grafted. Um, did you replace said section of the aorta with a graft, or is the aorta, the pressure that's built up, is it, just relieved and shrunk back down and then grafted over. So in order to try and address your very circuitous question, why don't I just tell you what we do? Why not? I'm gonna show you some cool stuff. Oh, fun. Hold on, I'll be right back. Oh, I scared the doctor away. So uh, Molly will have a question. Molly will, Molly will get her question. So here we have an aortic graft. This is actually one of the nylon grafts that we use in the operating room to replace the aorta with. This side arm we use for um, access to the aorta, but this is basically the tube. It's a nylon tube, as you can see. And sometimes we have super fancy tubes where we use these to connect a bunch of different blood vessels that go to the arm and the brain and things like that. And they come in various different flavors and sizes, mimicking the aortic arch, but the same idea. Now, the other thing we have is we have what's called a valve conduit. So this is a valve, and that's directly connected to the graft, and we put those in at the, at the level of the heart, such that the valve um, is, is already connected. I don't have to worry about that, but I do have to connect some of the other blood vessels. And that's the replacement of the aorta. The next thing that we will do in a lot of cases is we will put in an endovascular aortic stent graft. Now this is placed inside of the aorta and it lines the wall of the aorta where the aorta is presumably weak to give it strength. And in the, in the, um, in the, um, Cases of dissection, where part of the aortic wall is weak and part of it is strong because it has all the layers, we will place these in and redirect the blood flow in such a way that the springs of this will push out the aortic wall that's torn into the area that it used to be connected, and sometimes it will actually scar in and scar down. So you asked what happens afterwards. The simple answer is, is that once the aneurysm is removed in the case of aortic replacement, the aorta and the native uh, and the graft will connect and will line with your body's cells. And that will smooth out the whole aorta from the inside, the outside, still going to be a little rough and tumble until it scars in. And when we go back in, redo surgery can be a little challenging because of that. If I remember correctly, um, peeking in on some uh, 
of the meetings from the uh, AATS in, in Boston, I know noticed a lot of surgeons said they will occasionally set up um, inside for future surgeries. Is that something that? Uh, yes, that indeed. Can be done? Yes, indeed, we do, and I can show you a little bit of a picture for that if you would like. Um, 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 I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. I hope I don't want to gross anybody out, but here's here's a complex arch reconstruction uh, done a number of years ago, where um, if you look at this as being, this is the lung here, that's uh, the one that says lung, and this is the aortic graft I just showed you with all the little separate arms coming off, and this is a sort of a different construction. The, the part that's very difficult to show is what's going on on the inside. And what the inside is, is a connection at the aorta that is made across from the head vessels in what we called a half the arch or a hemi arch. The purpose of this is in order to take out this area of the aorta, which has been known for a long time to be an area of tremendous strain and stress where the aorta can grow if you only do the connection over here. Not in every case, but in many cases. But the other thing that we'll do sometimes is we will do the entire arch where instead of leaving this portion of aorta, we will take out the entire aorta, connect the branches that go to the brain, and then we will leave this piece called a elephant trunk. It's just a term that we use, purpose of which is to uh, place a, an aortic graft in the descending aorta, as you can see, and the purpose of which is to allow an area downstream from where we're working to be able to be set up for a future surgery. Now, in this particular case from many years ago, the patient had aortic surgery in this area, a type A dissection, and they had the remnant of the dissection or called a residual type B dissection. They then got a stent graft placed on the inside, but this was done after the surgery. Now, sometimes we'll do it at the exact same time as the surgery, and in those cases, or in the overwhelming majority of those cases, um, I'm going to show you a different picture, which I'm trying to find. In these cases, um, the stent graft is placed at the time of the surgery, and the reason is, is that hopefully we can come back and deal with the aorta without having to reopen the chest. But sometimes, uh, which was the case in this case, despite the fact that we put this here, this is a deceptive picture, which is what this was about. And that even though you see the, the graft here, the aorta is very, very much enlarged and very, very much uh, dilated outside of it. And the patient then needed a subsequent operation. And the operations that we can do are quite complicated. Um, but one of the things that we can do is in the case of the, the listener who's, um, I think her name was Chelsea, she has a type B dissection. We can actually go and cut the dissection and then place a stent graft on the inside uh, in order to uh, block blood flow from the very large uh, aneurysm segment. And when we have these new stent grafts, this was just approved a couple of months ago, we can rearrange the blood vessels uh, going to the brain and then deploy one of these stent grafts uh, in its place, the purpose of which obviously is to um, avoid having an open operation. But the one thing I wanted to point out is that everything, this is not all bad news, everybody, and I'm, I'm, I put this in my most recent presentations because everybody hears me talk and, you know, they want to go off and uh, have a drink because uh, they think I'm all bad news guy. But here's the truth. Here's the arch in a patient who had 
a type A dissection. And then here they still had a tear in the ascending and a tear in the descending. This is at six months. No reason to do surgery there. Two years later, things look pretty complicated. Okay, this is again the tear in the arch coming over the top, descending aorta. And here's five years later. This woman's aorta is completely healing. This is the tear in the ascending, and this is the descending. And so it's important that you know that the body sometimes will heal without us doing anything. And it's really, really important to let you know um, it's not all bad news. All right, and we got a, a question from Molly. Uh, a great question. Am I still sharing my screen? No. Good. Okay. Um, so the answer is, does it usually happen? No, but it can. I mean, all, any, any of these things can happen. I mean, these are the unfortunate complications of surgery. I mean, the things that I tell people, death, heart attack, stroke, lung, liver, kidney problems, bleeding, blood transfusion, reoperation, and infection. All of these things are potential problems. And it's not a matter of whether the heart is more affected or less affected, but any of these things can happen. Of course they can. The most important thing is to try to figure out the root cause of what happened and why your heart is affected, and then make sure you get on a really good medication regimen and, and try to get your heart as strong as it can be. Sue, you are, you are, you are such a wonderful person. I don't know what to say about you. Um, I haven't, Sue, but let's let's talk about it since you were so kind as to uh, as to bring it up. On October 9th, we are having the famous uh, aortic bridge walk. Um, the aortic bridge is our local group. Um, if you go to www.aorticbridge.org, you can click on join us aortic bridge. Um, we have these really cool orange shirts, which are literally behind me in the uh, in the office here. I think you may have actually seen them. You jump on the website. Um, you don't have to donate. It's not a requirement. This gives you a little cool uh, way to get to us. Um, this, when not behind the firewall of a hospital, will will show up with a um, order form where you just are basically signing up to uh, tell me what shirt size you are going to wear when you come to the walk. And we certainly hope that you can make it. It would be our pleasure to have you be there. Again, October 9th, 11 a.m., Cadman Plaza Park at Tillery Street in Brooklyn. Um, it's really a very cool place. Um, I can show you briefly here, uh, or can I? Maybe I can't. No, I can't. But it's a um, pretty neat place, downtown Brooklyn and walk over the, the famous Brooklyn Bridge, and we all tell stories about the uh, elephants and uh, Ringling Brothers and um, all kinds of cool stuff. It's a neat, neat, neat place. And then we get together and we eat, which is uh, something we're always, always appreciative of. If you feel it, definitely tell your surgeon for sure. Uh, unfortunately, we do uh, have an occasion to 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 go back in um, to take out pacing wires, sometimes sternal wires, uh, all kinds of stuff out of patients. Um, but definitely talk to your surgeon. You don't want that poking through your uh, skin and giving you an infection. So please go talk to your doctor and try and get that thing out. All right. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, Dr. Udelman. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much, Tim O'Reilly, and I look forward to seeing you shortly in the great city of Philadelphia of brotherly love. Likewise. Bye. Thank you, everybody.